Um, if I may invite Dr. Liao to join Dr. Over to field questions, and I now open the floor to invite questions from the audience. Let me start off by asking Prof. Obert, if I have a patient with pancreatic neuroendocrine trauma with liver only disease and the patient is not responding uh, to chemotherapy, failed PRT, will this be a good candidate for this uh, trial? Yeah, I think this is exactly the right type of the patients we are aiming at and uh, they should not be able to get more surgery and they should not be able to be treated with uh, local uh, treatments such as embolization or chemoembolization or uh, radioembolization. They should have received PRT without any effect. This is the group of patients we want for this treatment. In your opinion, how soon do you think this uh, technique can be translated to clinical practice? If we can raise the money during this year and maybe also early next year, which we hope we have got some indication that we might get the money we need, then we have about 18 months for production of the, of the virus to a GMP standard necessary to use in the patient. And at the same time, we had also to work with uh, the ethical committee at the university as well as the medical product agency in, in Sweden, similar to FDA, to, to get all the approvals. But hopefully <coughs> within the next uh, two years we, we can start the phase one, phase two trial. And then of course it depends on the results of our attempts. Okay, any question from the floor? Prof? Um, I'm a biomedical oncologist. My question is, you know, the use of virus as a, as a vector for delivering therapy is relatively new, but there are ongoing study. One of them is in prostate cancer, the PROSVEC study. How different is that technology or concept uh, compared to your concept? Because I see I saw in one of your slides there was one on prostate cancer. Yeah, and the group uh, by uh, Professor Magnus Essan is working on prostate cancer as well. I am not working with prostate cancer by myself, but uh, the difference between this virus we are using for the prostate and our virus is that uh, our vi virus is genetically uh, designed for neuroendocrine tumor with a chromogranin A promoter included. The other virus is more general virus, similar to what you have seen in other trials in, 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 cl in the clinic. <clears throat> Does it mean that uh, because you, you are using the chromogranin A as a promoter yeah. for delivery of the virus, if the tumor doesn't have the chromogranin A, doesn't express chromogranin A, you cannot deliver the virus to the tumor cells? I mean it will be definitely less effective, but uh, although you can't stain for chromogranin A in uh, some uh, high-grade tumors, you can find messenger RNA expression in, in most uh, the tumors, I think 85 to 90 percent of all neuroendocrine tumors express chromogranin A in some way. But in terms of toxicity, what would you expect the patient to experience compared to other forms of treatment? I mean, uh, so far uh, uh, it has not been uh, reported so much of toxicity in, in these um, uh, trials that has been uh, uh, done by other viruses. Uh, so uh, I, I can uh, not think about any particular uh, thing that uh, the patient can experience uh, from, from this. I, I think it will be rather safe to use it. I, I can't assume any side effects. Of course the virus will be cleaned by the uh, in some way by the immune system, but um, since we are doing inactivate uh, locally in the liver artery space, locally in the liver, and uh, I don't think we will see any effect of the uh, normal liver cells with increased uh, enzymes or uh, 
Since it has some immunomodulating effect, does it cause those uh, you know, flu-like symptoms? I, of course, uh, you can find flu-like symptoms, but that is usually, uh, if you look at what happened when, you st when we started to use interferon, alpha interferon in the management of the for tumors, the patient had flu-like symptoms for four or five days, and then it goes away. So that is something that, um, of course, can happen with this type of phytotherapy as well, because you deliver a lot of cytokines to the circulation. So, but uh, I think usually that goes away. And if you inject every uh, four weeks the, the this virus, another thing that we have noticed with other immune therapies is, of course, a chronic fatigue that can uh, happen. But otherwise. I Yes, we have a question. <coughs> Kiyo Lee, I'm an endocrinologist and I don't know very much about this. Uh, didn't Steve Jobs have this? Would uh, not Apple be keen to do a study with this? <laughs> that, <laughs> that was a good, uh, good question. I must say that um, Steve Jobs uh, did all the mistakes he could do by himself when he started to uh, reject uh, the current treatment protocols we had. Uh, I, I, he, he was never seen by me, he was seen by other colleagues, but I know what they have done. And uh, the worst thing they did in the final end was with widespread disease, they made a liver transplantation. And you can imagine when you put him on immunosuppression, it's formally just blow out. So, but he, he was a, a terrible guy to handle, I can tell you. <laughs> he, he always knew what uh, was best for him. And uh, I mean, in the beginning when he had a very small disease, he was taking herbs instead of active treatment, so. Uh, we have not asked them specifically. <laughs> A little more technical. Your dose, uh, your dose of the adenovirus is uh, f very high when it goes to 10 to 11. And I remember some years ago in Philadelphia, there was somebody that uh, died from that kind of dosages. I was wondering, would you, uh, you know, with your uh, micro RNA, would that prevent that kind of accident that happened some years yeah, ago in Yeah, Philadelphia. I think uh, definitely it will uh, prevent it because uh, it's uh, just going to the tumor cells. But uh, uh, the dose we have been talking about is based on the activity they have seen in prostate cancer that they have been given another type of tumor. But uh, the phase one trial is, will be a dose finding study, so we'll see uh, where we land. But uh, you are absolutely right, it's a high dose, yeah. <clears throat> this one question. Any other questions? Prof, yeah. Hume? To follow on Dr. Liao's question, one of the things about viruses is the ability to be incorporated into the uh, DNA of the host, you know. Yeah. So in patients where you're using viral as a vector, just like they try to use gene therapy in many conditions like cystic fibrosis and things like that, there seem to be longer-term complications of once the uh, genome of the virus gets incorporated into the host and if you have a, your chromon granin A, uh, are there any studies to see whether there could be longer term side effect like the second malignancy? I mean, uh, there is a difference if you if you talk about cystic fibrosis and you talk about uh, a malignant tumor. I mean, in most of the studies that has been done with viruses in malignant uh, tumors have been end stage patients with rather short survival time. Anyhow, so uh, we have very little. Uh, data uh, on uh, what uh, the long-term uh, effect will be of inclusion of the viral uh, DNA in in in, uh, in the patient. Uh, I think uh, 
the only cells that will considerably include viral DNA will be endocrine cells and of course that can happen then that other uh, neuroendocrine cells uh, such as in the, in the in the adrenal or in the thyroid and uh, pituitary and all these uh, might um, be uh, a problem in the long run but um, we we had uh, of course to to look more carefully into this but uh, so far very little have, has been re uh, reported any other question of the floor I have a question actually, if yeah. I could ask. Um, you have a slide, a uh, very interesting slide on Will Smith on Iron Legend, and you mentioned that you hope that the virus is not going to cause the same problem. So I, my question is the safety concerns of using adenovirus to treat patients this way. Um, is there any concern at all that something might just go wrong in the process of translating results from lab mice to human? I mean, uh, you must always be careful to translate from mice into humans. <laughs> I am always very reluctant. And I mean, the beautiful data we have here is, of course, uh, something that we cannot necessarily uh, translate di directly to the patient. So therefore, I think the important thing is the first phase, phase one trial where we make a dosing, um, titrate a dose, we're starting with low doses up to higher doses and see what is actually going on in the patient. But I think we need about 9 to 11 patients to find a correct dose and that can be uh, tolerated by the patient without any significant effect, uh, side effects. So, and from there we take it then to the uh, bigger phase 2 trial. But uh, it, of course, always a concern. And, but that is the way we always do with new agents. I mean, when you take the new medication with the Everolimus or the Zutent or the, the new agents, targeted agents for neuroendocrine tumors, you have the first, the same situation from the very beginning. It started with phase one trial and then you move into phase two and <coughs> finally in phase three and they will be registered. Thank you. Um, any other question, anyone? I think maybe we could take one more question, I think. Um, um, I do have one more question, actually. Um, you mentioned that in you know, the first phase, possibly nine to ten patients, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, the selection criteria you have briefly mentioned at the start, um, who was most suitable to be recruited for the trial. Uh, what about jurisdiction? Which uh, is it available globally? Do people can people sign up for it? How is it being done? I mean. Uh for the safety study, I think we will concentrate on Swedish patients because we had to have them very close to us to really monitor a lot of different parameters and also to perform uh, all the sophisticated PET scans that we plan to have in-house uh, for, for the follow-up. So during the phase one trial, I think we concentrate on the Swedish patients, but for the phase two part, we can include patients from, from other countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you both, Dr. Liao and Dr. Ober, for thank your you. insights. Um, if I can just ask you to remain on stage for a little while. Um, our CNET's president, Bill Claxton, would uh, like to present you with our token appreciation for your excellent presentations today. Okay, we'll be sending out links to the video of this talk um, if you want to share that with your uh, colleagues and friends. You also have with you a flyer describing the ongoing public funding initiative to support the development of this oncolytic virus therapy that you just uh, learned a while ago. 
And if you know of any net cancer patient, feel free to refer them to our association. We are very helpful. And uh, please also help us to spread the awareness of these disease. Well, okay, that brings us to the end of this program. Um, I would, on behalf of CNET, I would like to thank uh, Mount Elizabeth Novena Hospital for this great facility and their service. Um, I would also like to thank Dr. Liao for his tireless service to CNET, um, Novartis Oncology for your generous sponsorship, and last but not least, Dr. Oberg, for your unwavering commitment to NET's, NET's um, cancer research and patient care. Okay, thank you all for your participation. I hope you have enjoyed the talk. Now, don't go yet. Um, please join us for an informal cocktail reception at the back of this room. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.